What do abolitionists have to do with how we celebrate Christmas? Only the amazing women who decided to fight slavery by spreading holiday cheer. In the 1830s, the United States was already extremely divided over the issue of slavery. Northerners had begun formally organizing against the practice, including Bostonians, specifically Boston's women. Inspired by the recent efforts of William Lloyd Garrison, female abolitionists formed the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society in 1833. While many New Englanders didn't support slavery, many were also indifferent toward the issue. The Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society wanted to bring awareness to their cause, but needed the funds to do so. So, in 1834, these women, namely Maria Weston Chapman, Lydia Maria Child, and Louisa Loring, decided to host a small Christmas time fair where people could buy homemade Christmas gifts and meet fellow abolitionists. Held in one of the members' homes, the first event raised over $300 for the cause. The next year, again held in a member's house, a pro-slavery mob attacked the fair. So, Maria Chapman held it in her own home. When that was attacked, her parents hosted the event. Maria refused to be intimidated and defiantly proclaimed that the Christmas fair would be an annual event. Over the next 20 plus years, the fair became a Boston tradition, growing into, according to Uncle Tom's Cabin author Harriet Beecher Stowe, the most fashionable shopping resort of the holidays. In the months leading up to the fair, abolitionist women across New England formed sewing circles in their respective towns to create goods to sell at the fair in Boston. These sewing circles also provided a safe space to discuss abolition in rural areas, where their views might not be as supported. Chapman spread the word in William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator, the preeminent abolitionist newsletter of the era. The fair itself also became more openly activist in 1840, after introducing nighttime soirees and abolitionist lecturers, featuring both men and women. The goods for sale themselves reflected the cause. Quills were labeled, Weapons for Abolitionists. Watch cases read, The political economist counts time by years, the suffering slave reckons it by minutes. And by the early 1840s, Chapman added a new feature to the fair, a Christmas tree, one of New England's first. The tradition of the Christmas tree had been brought to America by German immigrants, and the fair organizers adorned it with children's gifts for sale, making it a prime attraction for New England families. The bazaar, as the fair became known after 1845, was taking off in popularity, occupying Boston's Faneuil Hall for over a week by the 1850s. But Chapman and the other organizers worried their abolitionist message was getting lost in consumerism. So Chapman officially abolished the fair in 1858, replacing it with annual gala dinners attended by the Anti-Slavery Society's most generous donors. But the Christmas Bazaar was successful in more ways than one. Not only did it raise money for the abolitionist cause, it demonstrated the growing political power of women. 